Hi, my name is Anna Bernstein. I've been the prompt engineer for Copy AI for the last couple of years, and I am here to share some prompt writing tips. So we're going to be looking at varying your language, labeling practices, linking everything together or causative language, how to approach negative commands, how to get the most out of your verbs, and finally context and the mode in which you should speak to the AI. Okay, so first up, synonyms. And I know this might seem basic, but I see people get stuck on this one all the time. They have a really cool idea for something they want the AI to do, or a cool idea for how to structure a prompt, a prompting strategy, and they try once, maybe twice with different iterations of it. It doesn't work and they go, okay, that strategy doesn't work, or it can't do that task. The truth is often just the right word can really improve performance or even unlock capabilities of the AI. At times it can be surprisingly picky with the language it pays attention to. And if your cool idea isn't working and the model isn't quite doing what you want, you should always try different ways of wording what you're doing. You can also try combining words, like sort of piling on synonyms in certain contexts where maybe you're having trouble really communicating to it that it should get the reader excited about something. So you're like, get the reader enthusiastic excited and hyped up about this thing. There are also always more ways of wording the thing you want than you think there are. You can say, give me the list of restaurants. And if that doesn't work, give me the full list. But if that doesn't work, you can say the complete list, the whole list, the total and abridged list, the list in its entirety, you know, be thorough when giving the full length list. Like you can play around with syntax that way. Uh, and this variety and experimenting with this variety can really help you find your way towards better prompts or even making fully non-functional prompts work. And if you're not sure what synonyms to use, I would recommend asking Copy AI Chat for synonyms. You know, you can say, give me 10 synonyms for the word direction, but you can also say, give me 10 ways of phrasing X, Y, Z thing. And you can always use our prompt improver. So this one also seems really basic, but I see it all the time. You need to not use synonyms when you are talking about specific elements of your prompt that you want the AI to work with. So if you're writing an email to a prospective customer and you've labeled the customer details, customer details, and then below that you've written, use the prospect details to write the email, it's going to get confused. Um, or even use the customer details to write the email to the prospect. Like you, you just want to be consistent in how you refer to things. You also, you can see on the right, there's an example of um, duplicating labels for elements of the prompt, which happens surprisingly often in the prompts I edit from other people. Um, if you're, you know, writing a prompt for a job description, you don't want a section in the brief to do that that's titled job description. It may not outright fail at the task, but it's the sort of covert failure where it does the task in a more tentative and lackluster way. Okay, so this topic is one of my favorites. It's really important. It will really change your prompt writing. Causative language. Causative language is how you clearly and richly relate elements of the prompt together, which helps the AI perform much, much better. So there's integrative, and you should use this when the AI is ignoring an element of your prompt, when you know you give it a brief and you want it to write something using that brief and it's not doing it. You give it feedback um, from a client on a post and it's just not using the feedback. Um, and you, the idea of causative language is that you want to use words that imply causation, like below is a brief in the resulting content or give me the resulting content. You also want to make the sentence more tightly wound syntactically. So you might say, instead of here's the client feedback, feedback, rewrite the post. You might say, use the feedback above to rewrite the post or apply the feedback above to the post. And we're actually going to see this in action. We're in chat by Copy AI, and I'm just going to paste in the prompt, which is this post about writing a clear and effective problem statement, I've labeled it client feedback. It's too wordy and not punchy enough. I've said, rewrite the post. To ensure success in any project, a clear and effective problem statement is crucial. Follow a structured process that includes defining the purpose, I did blah, 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 blah. And you know, it's somewhat better than the original, but it's not that much better. Didn't really do the task. So let's take a different approach. Instead of rewrite the post, let's say, 
apply the client feedback to the post. And you can see how tightly wound that sentence is. Each part of it kind of can't exist without the other. A clear and effective problem statement is essential for project success. Follow a structured process to define the purpose, identify key issues, conduct research, and analyze data. With a well-crafted statement of problem, you'll have a solid foundation for your project and can move forward with confidence. So you can see that it took the client feedback in and integrated it more into what it was actually doing. And you end up with a better result. So integrative language is one type of causative language, but there's also a transformative language, which you should use for sort of the opposite situation. When the AI, rather than not integrating parts of the prompts to closely together enough, is actually sticking too closely to an element of the prompt. It's pulling things verbatim, it's paying too much attention to one part of it, and it's not taking it and working with it in a new way. So we're back in chat by Copy AI, and let's see some transformative language in action. So let's say below is a poem, and then Two Roads Diverge in Yellow Wood by Robert Frost, and then take the above, turn it into song lyrics. This is what not to do for transformative language. Let's see that. So it, it's doing somewhat of its own thing, but it's like really borrowing very heavily, like entire lines. Like I shall be telling this with a size, somewhere ages and ages tense. And it, I mean, it just starts very, very similarly. So this is a full line from the poem. So let's try again with some transformative language this time. So now that we've cleared chat, let's see how this looks with transformative language. So if I just put in the same prompt, but instead at the end, I've written, take the concepts in the poem above and reimagine them as song lyrics. So you can see it's, it's appropriately diverging a little more. It's doing its own thing. It realizes it needs to transform the original piece of text it's been given. It needs to take it and work with it and make something new out of it. And that's where this language comes in, where you kind of distance it from the original in a way, but you're still clear about the relationship. It's not distancing in a vague way. It's a specific distancing from the original. So next we have avoiding negative commands. A lot of you might've heard this one before. It's pretty straightforward. The AI loves to think about pink elephants if you tell it not to think about pink elephants. So especially for things that are conceptual, um, like don't be too formal, it'll be like, huh, formal. I've heard that word before, I know what that means. And it might have an inkling of like, I shouldn't be formal, but it'll be fighting itself because you will have put in its brain the idea of formality and it'll be focused on that. So you'll either see the opposite effect of what you want or kind of no effect. So what's better is to say, can I convert this command into the positive version? Can I say, keep it casual rather than don't be too formal? All right, so let's see this in action. Let's say, write an email, apologizing for faking a crop circle. Don't use a formal or stiff tone. And it's doing exactly that. I hope this email finds you well. I wanted to reach out and apologize for something that has been weighing on my mind lately. You see, I have a confession to make. Um, so it's it's using, you know, I'm sorry if I caused any confusion or disappointment. Um, I value our friendship. It's It's obviously doing the exact opposite of what you asked. So let's try this again, but with a positive command this time. So same thing, but we're gonna say, use a casual and informal tone. I know it wasn't cool. I was just trying to have a little fun. I realized that was a dumb idea. Let's catch up soon. So you can see that it listens more when you distract it essentially with the positive version of the thing you're trying to do. So the next tip is about verbs. And basically what I see a lot of are people saying things like rewrite this to be shorter or you know give more information and details about this write an interesting hook they kind of meander around the purpose of their prompt 
And the verbs, they use the same verbs over and over again. They say, you know, rewrite or write or give this. Um, and I would encourage a lot more creativity and purpose with your verbs. Be much more intentional with your, with your verbs. It can be very powerful to have a very descriptive verb that really embodies the main task of the prompt. So instead of rewrite this to be shorter, you might say condense this. Instead of give more information and details about this, you might say elaborate on this. Instead of write an interesting hook, you might say hook the reader. And you'll notice with the last one that also allows you to have more room to enrich it with other details and with other things you want it to do. You can add more adverbs this way that can be helpful. So let's see an example of this. Let's say write an introduction that gets the reader's attention about AI in agriculture. Are you aware that agriculture is one of the industries that can greatly benefit from the advancements in AI? Okay, but it's not the most grabbing. It's not the punchiest. It doesn't have words in there where I'm like, whoa, what? Um, which, if you know anything about AI and agriculture, there's a lot of crazy stuff going on, so there's a lot of room for that. So let's see what else it can do. So what if instead we said, hook the reader's attention about AI in agriculture? This is a lot better. Did you know that artificial intelligence is revolutionizing the way we farm? There's a lot in there, but it's delivered in a, in a punchy, more hooky way. So lastly, I want to talk about context and I want to talk about the way we talk to the tools we use. We've all come to sort of speak this language of search engines, which is not the way you talk to a human being. And with chat, it's actually a much better idea to err on the side of speaking to it like a human being rather than like a machine. So there's something I call the sheet of paper test. Um, there are lots of people at Copy AI who write prompts besides me. A big part of my job is education. And I'm always yelling about the sheet of paper test and it does help where if you printed out a sheet of paper with the prompts you were working on on it and you gave it to a person, you get the two favorite people I love to cite are a ninth grader or data from Star Trek, either one, you gave it to them, would they know what to do? Not if you gave it to a search engine, not if you gave it to your idea of what a search engine would be like if AI was integrated into it, but if you gave it to a human being, would they understand the task at hand and be confident in what the task actually was? This can be achieved through greater clarity. Uh, I've seen a lot of prompts where, you know, nowhere in the prompt does it actually say what you want. I've seen people after applying the sheet of paper test realize that they had actually told it to do something else. If they read it really literally, they had actually told it to write an entire email rather than just, you know, part of an email or something, which was what they actually wanted. So think about what you actually want and be clear about that. This can also be achieved through more context, through just giving more context and being clear about where that context fits in, not just throwing it willy nilly in the way that, you know, if you just copy and pasted a whole thing onto a sheet of paper, handed it to someone and didn't tell them why that information was being included. So more context equals better output, relevant context equals better output, and clear context equals better output. Really everything I've covered here boils down to two things. You want your prompts to be rich and you want them to be clear. And if you do that, you're going to get great output. So that's all. Happy prompt writing.